there are many cool Minecraft clone projects on YouTube, but most of them kinda stop midway with the implementation. For my clone, however, I wanted to have a fully finished game, so today I will start adding enemies and other entities in the game. For this, I had to almost completely refactor the server to simulate the world or multiple threads, create an entity component system that works fully at compile time, and load and animate 3D models, and of course, write some AI logic, so let's go! The most difficult part about this project is the fact that it is multiplayer. You see, I can't just add a pig model to the world and write some logic for it to move around. The pig will be created by the server and it needs to be sent to the players that are close and then only the server will control the pig's AI, but both the player and the server need to simulate physics on it. And the server also needs to keep the clients updated with the new pig information. Bro, at this point I would rather give up and open up a car dealership. Last time I managed to make a dropped item work like this, but now I just need an abstraction to do all of this networking code for all the entities without having me to repeat code. Also, something that allows me to reuse code for entities would be nice. Something like an entity component system could work nicely here. This means a system where to create a new entity, I would specify that it has a rigid body and that it is an animal, and the code would automatically do physics and AI on it. And you know me. I want to use polymorphism for this. I found something better, and it is called compile time polymorphism. Yes, it is different, and I will explain in detail how it works later in the video. And after some fiddling around with it, I managed to abstract all of the networking code away. So this is the update function for a zombie server side, and this one is for the client. They both have a common update function to handle the physics, but only the server will tell the zombie to move. And this code will handle all of the networking synchronization time delay, and also smoothing out the synchronizations. And yes, that is a zombie. I am scared of implementing 3D skeletal animations, so I am delaying it as much as possible, because I am irresponsible. And to postpone implementing that even more, I first refactored the entire server architecture, because I found this nice idea online. Right now, I just updated Chunk, an entity, in a single thread. This is also what Minecraft does, and it can cause a problem if there are too many players that are too far apart. There are too many chunks loaded, lagging the game. I found something online, however, suggesting to update these regions in different threads. They are not touching after all, so they couldn't possibly introduce race conditions. And this is what I did. Now the server will launch more threads, if needed, to update the world in different areas. Also, each chunk holds its own entities, reducing the cost of things like entity collision with each other, or searching for entities that are close to a specific point in the world. But I'll talk about this with some more interesting details in the next video that will be entirely dedicated to how the server works, so make sure you subscribe to not miss that. Ok, next I wanted to finally add 3D models. Luckily, someone from my Discord suggested me to use Blockbench, which is a modeling software specifically made for making Minecraft models, and it already has all the entities of the game already made. So I stole a Minecraft pig and changed it a little to make it cuter. So thanks again to Hackerham for his help. He also has his own voxel game called Tessera, that's actually more advanced than mine, so you might want to check it out. Now, loading 3D models is not that difficult. Wait, you didn't see that. So, loading 3D models is not that difficult. Yes, that's a zombie. I gave him a shark hoodie, because my zombies have drip. Also, the player model has the second layer of clothes, so I can load models like this. What is difficult, however, is animating them. I have already implemented skeletal animations a long time ago, and it took like one entire week. Plus, they still don't work perfectly. So, I was just very scared to do this again, until I noticed that Minecraft models are very easy to animate. I just need to rotate the individual limbs of the model, and that's it. And I will do the animations from the code. And this brings us to here. Now, it's time to explain how the entity component system that allows me to write the AI for these little piggies works. Whenever you create an entity, you need to create these three structs. This is the common data that will be sent between the server and the client, and these two other classes hold the client and server implementations. So this takes care of both the data synchronization and the different implementation logic between the client and the server. Now each entity type is held in a separate container, but this is not that bad, and it is actually a good pattern in game dev, and it can make the game faster. To not repeat code for each container, I write the logic that needs to happen once using a lambda, and I can call it for each container. This lambda doesn't care what struct it receives, 
as long as it has the members that it uses. And if it doesn't have some component, you can check that at compile time and not update that component if it doesn't exist. So this check happens even before the game runs. To me, this looks like magic already, and I haven't even talked about components yet. Usually, I don't use inheritance, but here they tie things together very nicely. So to add a component to an entity, just inherit from it. And you can see that the server and the client entities always inherit some special components that add some networking time synchronization logic. Ok, now, here is where the interesting thing comes into play. My pig has a head and a body orientation, so I inherit from this class. The server will write into them to tell the pig where to look at and the client will nicely interpolate between the last value and the new one. To do this, I can simply check if the current entity does have this member and if so, run the interpolation logic. And I even added getters that will return the value of a default one if uh, this component doesn't exist. This looks like what you do in Java or in Python, but it is done in C++ at compile time and the compiler can optimize the code a lot better. Otherwise, with normal polymorphism, I would have to store entities with an extra pointer, adding cache misses, but every entity update, plus extra cost for the virtual dispatch. Plus, now I have to manage all the memory for these entities. And the cool things don't stop here. Here is why I opted for inheritance. I will add an animal behavior component to the pigs of the server. This will make the pigs randomly move around, but it also interacts with the pigs orientation and head direction. So this component needs to interact with things that are inside another one. No problem, I can just take that info from the base class using what is called CRTP. Basically, I inherit a component that has the template argument, the base class, allowing me to access base class elements from the derived component class. And this derived class doesn't care where the components come from. They can just come from any component that has these members, or I can put them myself there as members. That's why I use inheritance. And of course, I can always check if that entity doesn't have a head orientation component and just remove that code related to it, if so. If you found this interesting, I actually want to do a live Discord call where I will explain how these templates work in more details. And also, post that record on YouTube, so join my Discord if you want to see the live discussion. So with this, I made the piggies move around randomly. And they will even look at players from time to time, oh my god, they are so cute. I also made them jump blocks if possible, and not fall down in holes that are two blocks deep. And I also added some nice touches, like they look down when they see a hole or look up when jumping a block. For the zombies, however, I will need to implement something smarter to follow the player. I can't possibly run a pathfinding for each zombie, so I am thinking of running a flood field from the player outward, only once, and use that to update every zombie. But that will have to happen in another video. So if you found this video interesting, Share it with others, and don't forget to subscribe to not miss on the next video that will be on the server related things. See you there!